Hi, my name is Jacob Clapper. I'm uh, the features are editor for uh, seminars in thoracic surgery uh, for the topic of the implementation of the new CAS scoring system for lung transplantation and the impacts that has had on the various transplant programs around the country. And joining me today is Chad Denlinger from Indiana University, Matthew Hartwig from Duke University, and Stephanie Chang from NYU. Uh, I've put together a number of questions around CAS. I'm very interested to hear our panelists' uh, interpretation of the new CAS system. So I thought I'd start with Stephanie with a question. Yeah. I provided all the qu we provided the questions beforehand so everybody could uh, think about them. Uh, Stephanie, the travel distance has increased significantly uh, for many programs since the introduction of CAS. Uh, the median distance from the donor hospital to the transplant program after implementation was 353 nautical miles. Before it was about 195. How has this impacted your donor selection? Um, and again, if you had any geographic limits before in terms of who, how far you would travel for an organ, have these new realities changed your selection process? I, I don't think our selection has changed, but we've definitely noticed that we get much more offers from far away. So mm -hmm. being sequenced to on a donor in Texas is a new mm -hmm. new thing for us. Yeah. Um, you know, I think all of us here think if it's a good donor and we have a recipient, I'm going to go for it. But um, now I've started to use a lot more local procurements. So um, we reach out to the surgeons there. I know Dr. Denlinger and I have had chats about this as well. So um, that's what we've started to do to try to mitigate the cost. And then I know there's all those other things. So we've started using paragonics um, to try and increase the time that we can have the organs ischemic as well. Right, right. Uh, Matt, how is... Uh what, have you, what are your impressions of local procurement that Stephanie mentions in terms of how you vet these individuals who you may not be familiar with? Yeah, I mean, that's um, there's a lot to go into there. I think that one of the challenges as a community right now that we have, um, which we have not addressed, and I'm not sure exactly how we're going to address this, is sort of the lack of, of oversight and a way to vet um, procuring surgeons, mm -hmm. right? And so... On the thoracic side, um, we have no certification process, um, and so um, we actually don't have an objective measurement of, um, of whether folks have a lot of experience and whether they um, know what they're doing. Now, I feel like we're very fortunate in that um, the vast majority of our experiences with um, procuring surgeons from around the country has been very positive mm -hmm. and very beneficial, um, but I do think everybody would feel a lot more comfortable as more and more programs rely upon um, sort of third-party procuring services or local procurement, um, if we had a better way to um, train, standardize the process, and um, and also to um, certify or uh, oversee uh, some of these, uh, you know, some of these uh, programs that are out there. And one of the first steps is something that was presented earlier today at a session at the meeting um, where the AATS has come out with a consensus document on um, mm -hmm. lung preservation and procurement. Um, and hopefully that's the beginning of a lot of efforts towards this, uh, you know, this process of uh, trying to better um, uh, ensure the quality of everything that's happening up there. Right. Chad, you're, you're somewhat geographically in a different position being more in the in the center of the country are you relying on your own uh, team still for procurement or have you have you experienced have any experiences with local procurement so uh, two separate answers uh, for us in our program and offers that we accept it's pretty rare that we ask someone else a third party or other uh, individuals to procure for us mm -hmm. Um, we're able to uh, procure the vast majority of our own donors mm -hmm. uh, Part of the situation is unique because of our own local OPO, the Indiana Donor Network, owns their own planes, right. which facilitates traveling. We just call IDN. Mm -hmm. We set up the flight. It's very convenient yeah. and, and, and efficient. So we haven't used third parties. But on the receiving end, it's not unusual. Several a month, other programs call myself or my partner mm -hmm. and say, can you procure for us? Right. Uh, particularly there in Indianapolis in our procurement center, we're happy to do it. Right. Uh, it takes a few minutes of our time. Uh, minimizes travel, and so we send out plenty. We, we don't ask for much. That That's our, our practice. Okay. Stephanie, what's your arrangement? Are you still chartering flights? Yeah, so we, we work very closely with um, Trinity and Blade, and so 
um, when we can, we send out our own procurement surgeons. We charter our own flights. Mm -hmm. um, but then in certain places, so um, if I if we know each other, so if something comes from Duke, you two are going to be getting a call. Right, so right. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm going to call him. <laughs> so for the people I know, then that's when I that's when I ask for local procurement. Yeah, our experience is, is we're spending quite a bit of money on third-party procurements because we are traveling so much. I guess, question, I guess, I'll add, ask you, Matt, since we've we've had personally had discussions about this, is that at what point did these financial realities overwhelm the benefits of geographic sharing, in your opinion? Yeah, I mean, I think ultimately, but ultimately what this comes down to is a mathematical formula of um, how much weight should we put on efficiency and travel distance, um, which impacts costs, you know, considerably, versus how much weight do we put on the need to um, decrease uh, waiting list mortality and um, and increase the transplant uh, rate? And and we started with, you know, the CAS, which has a certain proportion of points that are given to travel efficiency. And as we gather the data, we can do better modeling, and then we can, I think, do better um, and more um, sort of precision strikes within CAS to try and optimize the formula a little bit better. We don't know the number yet, mm -hmm. um, and I don't know the each, you know, the absolute costs or the financials around it is going to vary so tremendously by the local environment, by the contracts that the um, centers have with their payers. Um, and by decisions, you know, made by CMS and the um, federal government that it's a little hard to know for any particular center what that um, maximum threshold is mm -hmm. going to be. It's going to vary, I think, center to center. Stephanie, have you had any discussions with your administrators or heads of your transplant institute about costs around yeah. what, you're, what you're spending to get these organs from Texas? Yeah, so, um, w you know, if I'm going to charter a plane and the bill is going to be Thirty-five thousand for a potential negative run. They do call and they're like, "Are you sure? Mm -hmm. Do you really want to do this?" No, really. um, and and it limits where I will go for DCD significantly. Okay. I will not take that risk um, outside of maybe a thousand mile radius, and mm -hmm. it's not because I don't think it's a good organ. It's because I can't keep financially taking those hits if if the donor doesn't pass within right. a certain time. Right. Um, so yeah. Can we go back, you know, just for a second about mm. this this requesting of of centers to do procurements for you? So you, you're very open to this idea. Um, typically, I mean, when I'm I'm hesitant to call other um, uh, people in the sort of um, field that I know because I assume they've got you know they have day jobs and they have night jobs and they have weekend jobs and they have other responsibilities and. A lot of times when I'm called, I, I simply, I just don't have anyone um, who's available to go procure. And I, um, is that not a, a common scenario for you as you call your friends in the business, if you will? Yeah, so I think for certain places, so for us, we have two procurement surgeons. So if you ever call us in New York, like, we'll go do it. That's mm -hmm. not an issue. I've gone and done it. And right. it's fine because it's so rare for us. Um, in St. Louis, they have their own, you know, transplant center. We all know that they have their own procurement surgeons. So that's where I do it the most. Um, and in general, just because it hasn't become that um, frequent yet, everyone just says yes. Uh, we, we've started talking about it. I'm sure Luis has asked you. I think that it would be nice to start having that because I've gotten the bill from a third-party procurement service. I was told they had local procurement. Local meant flying someone in mm -hmm. from next door to me, and I was like, well, that that's not right. And now you're paying for multiple flights. You're paying all these other organ expenses. And I got a bill for $80,000 for a negative run. Right. Like, I should have just sent my own plane. So... so our, our situation's ideal in mm -hmm. Indiana because with our local procurement center, mm -hmm. like St. Louis, virtually all donors in our state come to Indianapolis. Right. And that center is 15 minutes from my house. Yeah. And they run much more efficiently than hospital donors mm -hmm. because if they say 2 o'clock, it really means 2 o'clock. Right. And I can drive there, walk in the door at 1.50, and the patient's on the table ready mm -hmm. to go. So it takes uh, as short as an hour and a half of my time versus three hours and that easily uh, replaces flying. So yeah. that's why I'm happy to do it for anyone that right. calls me to say, especially in the middle of the night, I'm not doing anything else, we can make it work. Yeah, that's that is that's excellent. But like, like Stephanie was alluding to, when you do hire these procurement agencies, you do need to review the financials behind what they're, what the estimated costs are before you send someone, before you agree to uh, 
to their services. Yeah, and the We've gotten burned. costs for the surgeon and also for, for the, the transportation, transportation. Which is not always on that invoice. Right. That is, um, um, in review, you know, in, in preparing for this, I, I was looking at the OPTN final rule uh, based around CAS, basically their motivation for CAS, which was improving access to transplant, which I think they've shown they have done, avoiding futile transplants, efficiently placing organs and reducing the role of geography, which we've spent some time discussing. Uh, so they've, they've, they've accomplished that. I was, I was intrigued by the term futile transplant. Which group of patients do you think that they're trying to discourage us from transplanting? Is it the bridge to ECMO? Is it the older patients? Is it the redos? Um, thoughts? Is it all of those, Stephanie? Yeah, you know, I, I've been wondering the same thing since your talk earlier today because <laughs> yeah. I don't know what a futile transplant is. I think a lot of us already think about what's the risk. Are we willing to take it? Mm -hmm. Is it too high? Um, the patients on ECMO, their scores still go through the roof, so that's yeah. definitely not what they're trying to limit. I wonder if it's the patients that are in their mid-70s, mm -hmm. you know, they're not the ones that are going to have the five-year benefit. Right. Maybe that's what they're referring to, um, but I'm not sure. Would you agree, Chad? I totally agree. Mm -hmm. um, as Stephanie said, uh, people on ECMO, they get transplanted immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the 70-year-old, 70-year-old plus. Right. that have the lower CAS score, mm -hmm. that it's hard to find donors. So the way the system's working, the people that are um, harder to transplant are the elderly because of the diminished long-term survival. Mm -hmm. So maybe futile is not the best word, but just the less efficacious transplant, right. get less use of the organs. Right. That's how the CAS system works. Yeah, and I think that that's, I mean, you know, it's always interesting to me how people seem to focus on certain things about the final rule, but they don't, I think, take the final rule completely together mm -hmm. in context. And this geographic sharing is, is I think, one of those things where um, a lot of folks in the community were really focusing on this idea of an, as a national, you know, resource, mm -hmm. organ donation, um, but forgetting that it shouldn't come at the expense of these other things. Um, ultimately, you know, again, it comes down to math, right? But the the post transplant survival models are supposed to define that futility for mm -hmm. us. Um, I think that the challenge is is that the the math just isn't great, great. at this point, right? Around the around, around the estimated the, around five the year survival, right? Mm -hmm. You know, if you if you look at some of the you know statistical predictions around it, it is better than a coin flip, mm -hmm. but not by all that much. Actually, yeah. Um, and I think it's really interesting how we settled on, you know, five-year survival. There was a lot of um, advocacy, I would say, from the community, um, both physician and non-physician, to focus more on long-term, longer-term survival than the one year, which mm -hmm. we've been doing for a long time. Um, and that, again, that changes the math. And you know, if the most important function in that formula of predicting five-year survival is age, then that's going to play a big role in sort of where people end up on the list. And it, it, people say, well, the five year is just as good or just as bad as the one year, which is, you know, it could be, it's both, mm -hmm. right? It is just as good, but right. it's also just as bad at, right. at, at that prediction model. So, Jen. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was in putting, again, in putting this together, I thought about I think we all are predominantly transplanting patients with restrictive lung disease. You know, I think that obviously, I think any center, that is the predominant uh, disease subtype that we're transplanting. And like you said, the new system organs are based on expected five-year survival. And that patients who used to have the best expected five-year survival were the CF patients. And so the introduction of this scoring system coincides pretty closely with essentially those patients disappearing for now. We've had discussions about whether they'll return at a at a later age, and you know if you look at the ISHLT guidelines from 2021, over 30 percent of patients on the wait list are over the age of 65. So is fi again I going back to this whole concept of expected five-year survival? Is that really a fair metric given the realities of the patient population that we're transplanting? Most of us. Any thoughts there? I guess it's hard to say, but what's the alternative? As Matt said, you can use one year, three year, pick, pick your time. Yeah. Uh, I think the goal, which we should adhere to, is uh, how do you get the most life, most benefit out of each set of uh, potentially transplantable, transplantable organs? Right. 
Well, I guess my question is, was is five years just too ambitious? Should should given the patient population, should we have shot for something that more is more modest, like uh, like three years, for instance? Any, any thoughts, Stephanie? I mean, I I guess my question is, is there per se a, that much of a difference between if you're looking at three year versus versus five year? Mm -hmm. Like when the curves separate, they I feel like they separate a little. Earlier, earlier on and yeah. so I don't necessarily know if that's that's that different and I think we have to just pick a number and stick with it stick with it okay I mean I think it to me when I think about this it's less important the time frame that's chosen and what's probably more important is is um, better developing the inputs into these models so that they're um, more accurately predictive of what's going to happen mm -hmm. so if you could tell me that uh, you know the one year is going to have a 0.8 versus the five year is going to have a 0.6, I would rather have a much more accurate one year right. um, than a less accurate you know five year, even though that's a longer survival Rival, period. Right. And so, um, that, to me, I think that when we think about these survival models, we should really be focusing on trying to enhance uh, the accuracy of the predictive tools that we have. Because right now, I, I just feel like we're we're lacking that. I mean, you look at the on the hard side, right? They re they have refused to put in post transplant survival mm -hmm. into their model today because they say they're that they don't have the data to predict it. Mm. I mean, they've got a lot more data yeah, than we have. do. Yeah, um, and um, and so uh, so again, I think I think for me, the biggest and, and most important feature of this post transplant survival and and this whole idea of a futile transplant is is optimizing the predictive tools that we have that right now don't account for a lot of what we face. Speaking of predictive tools, um, obviously they don't always reflect the severity of the patient's illness, or particularly in the older patients, they're waiting longer, which has led to an increase in the, uh, in, uh, in the exceptions that are being submitted, uh, many of which are not uh, being accepted or acknowledged. But uh, have you found that your individual institutions, you've been submitting more exemptions for patients that are waiting longer on the wait list, particularly the older patients? And have you had success? Yeah, we actually have not submitted exceptions, and I'm not really on the panel to review them, so I don't see the volume coming in. Yeah, We haven't used that tool yet, but we have some people in their 70s uh, with IPF mm -hmm. and increasing oxygen requirements that are at risk of missing their transplant window before they become too deconditioned, so right. maybe we should be submitting exceptions for those folks. Mm -hmm. Stephanie, have you, your team been submitting exceptions? Yeah, we're, we're very rare at doing exceptions, and when we do them, it's generally for the multi-organ failure, mm -hmm. where the LAS is not going to accurately reflect how sick they are. Um, we have never, we haven't done it for anyone in their 70s, just because we, we like it to make an impact when we submit it. Okay. <laughs> so you're not flooding them with No, the, I think no. we've done three in the last two years. Okay. Okay. We have. We have done some. What yeah, do you think? I mean, I think, it, so when I look at it, there are some things to me that um, uh, stand out as um, barriers to access that aren't currently um, accounted for in the CAS, right? And so just as an example, right now we have these three biologic factors, right? We've got CPRA, we have um, ABO, um, and we have height, and mm -hmm. the height is, is a surrogate for chest cavity size, right? Um, and w the curves for those are not linear, right? So the, and, and, and what I mean by that, the points that you get for any one of those um, starts off very low, and then only at the extremes do you start to see more significant points being mm -hmm. awarded for these different biologic features. But what happens is if you, for example, if you have a low number of all three of those things, because of the nonlinear function of the point system, you're actually significantly more disadvantaged, but you're not getting the same points that you would. If you only had one of those features that was that high, you would get a lot more points mm -hmm. than if you have a little bit of all three. Right. So that's an example where we've gone and, and articulated a case where we think that there are biological disadvantages for this particular individual. Um, and it's probably, you know, it should be considered and the current cast just doesn't account for that. And I think that's what, I mean, in reality, that's what exceptions are for mm -hmm. is to, is, you know, if you have fairly um, obvious and significant disadvantages in allocation that can't be accounted for by the current process, then that's when a, a, an exception should be placed. I mean, 
in reality, most of the exceptions are probably still for um, some of the standard, you know, pH exceptions would have been there for a long time and which are, you know, essentially universally accepted at this point, but simply aren't built into the, you know, the risk profiles for, for mortality. Chad, we talked earlier about the subject of biological disadvantages, one being blood type, particularly the O's, and you had some, you had some thoughts about the blood type O, which is, uh, is a disadvantage that they've they've tried to accommodate for. for your yeah, as Matt just said, that's one of the three biological factors that gets up to five points uh, in the CAS system. Uh, when the system was initially implemented, I think uh, the blood group O, which is the most disadvantaged, um, got half a point, mm -hmm. uh, which seems pretty small. And what we noticed right away is we, our O's were stacking up in the list. It was difficult to find organs right. because other blood groups were uh, competing for blood group O uh, donors. Mm -hmm. But if 45% of the population is blood group O, our O recipients have access to just that segment of the population, whereas the entire country, all the other recipients can uh, right. compete for the O donors. Mm -hmm. uh, they have since revised that, where now there's uh, five points allocated, and uh, it's, time will tell. Right. But my impression at this point, it's still much more difficult to find donors for O recipients than any of the other blood groups. Mm -hmm. And whether that's just the way it's going to continue or if there's still a backlog of patients from the first half of the year when they were getting half a point that we now have to work through and find organs for right. all of these as a country and eventually it might equilibrate. Right. Um, I recently looked at the uh, entire wait list mm -hmm. based on looking at uh, UNET for, for different um, recipients of mine, mm -hmm. and the proportion of people on the list did not match population groups. Mm. There were, uh, I forget the exact numbers, but roughly 65% of the list was blood group O, mm -hmm. substantially more than the 45% of the true population, right. suggesting that as a country there were more O's than there should be. So at this point, they're still disadvantaged, and whether it's just a backlog issue or if it's an ongoing issue that needs to be further accounted for, uh, time will tell. Yeah, I mean, it's been a year now. You would think we would have worked through most of those patients. They would have either been transplanted or, or removed from the list for various reasons. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, there was a a little bit of a programming snafu to start mm -hmm. with, right? Right. And so um, I think one of the, uh, which is unfortunate, but it also I think is a reflection of some of the benefits of this um, new system was that um, you know, we were we were keeping a close eye on it as far as the OPTN is concerned uh, with regular reviews, and then you know the OPTN is getting feedback from all these programs, you know, that are like, hey, we've got a lot of O's that mm -hmm. aren't getting transplanted. Something seems a little off, and right. and this was noticeable, and um, you know, within a, what I think a relatively short period of time. Uh, the OPTM was able to go back and look and identify this um, programming issue that led to um, a fairly dramatic um, challenge for the O's getting transplanted and within a relatively short period of time got a policy change, got it out for public comment, mm -hmm. got it you know, approved and implemented. Mm -hmm. Um, and so by you know, September, um, the ABO upgrade had occurred. Um, so, and, and then I think that that is a separate challenge from what we're seeing now, and Chad brought this up, is, is you know, they got five points, which is the maximum right. allow. But, but that raised everybody's score. Um, everybody got that benefit. It was an O. It was an O. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But yet we still seem anecdotally, and the same thing when we look at our list, right, mm -hmm. we feel like the O's aren't getting right. as many offers um, and don't have the same transplant rate. And I think that bears out in the data that's being accumulated say over the last you know three to six months even since the abo change we are i think we are still seeing a slower transplant rate and access to transplant for the o for the o's yeah um i think we need to demonstrate that it's definitely better than it was before we were giving them five points and i think the question is going to be you know now is is five really enough is it enough, um yeah. and i think that remains to be determined my my impression and my suspicion is that we'll probably even need more than five and we'll need to figure out a way to do that uh, but again I, it's much better than it was but I think still a challenge Stephanie does the blood types do some of these biological disadvantages factor into how you determine whether a patient is a uh, transplant candidate whether they're for instance if they're 
70 years old, small chest, high PRA, blood type O, and you're, you're concerned that, that their wait list time is going to be longer and whether they're going to essentially uh, not make it in time to transplant due to these disadvantages. Is that, is that impacting whether you select that patient as a recipient or not? So um, our selection criteria have not changed. Mm -hmm. I think we owe it to them. Um, I realize, yes, we all live against a, a national benchmark of time to transplant weightless mortality, but I think it's better to give them the chance, and I'm okay with my stats getting a ding so long as I can potentially help them. I think, um, you know, the bigger thing that I do is now I, I temper their expectations and I say, yeah. you know what, you are 73, you're five foot two, right. you're an O. It's going to be a while. It's not going to be a month. It's, I know that, you know, certain programs, mm -hmm. you guys have a very short transplant time as well. Um, I tell them, no, you're, you are going to be waiting. Yeah. That's an extremely important point because you're setting that expectation. Where in the past, whereas in the past, their LAS may have been 60 or 70. You could almost well, at, at the at high volume centers like ours, you could almost ensure that patient was going to be transplanted in a week or so. Now you really have to have that discussion up front because the longer these patients, and we have a patient like this on the list now who's who's been on the list quite a long time, and he's watching his peers slowly be transplanted. And that creates a, a, the rumor mill, particularly, you know, on social media and whatnot. You have to be careful with that. So establishing that early on is a, a really good point. I've taken to showing them the way that their CAS score is calculated. The OPTN has a very nice interactive feature. It's about a four-minute video. And that helps people understand, particularly the older patients, why they're going to wait longer and get ahead of that messaging before, before it, uh, it overtakes you. Um, in terms of, again, older donors or patients with biological disadvantages, how has it changed your use of extended criteria donors or your reliance on uh, DCD or EVLP, Chad? Yeah, it's a huge factor. Um, we have the same conversation up front as you do. Mm -hmm. Older donor, uh, the cast will be low, expect to wait longer. And then on the donor selection, we're much more aggressive about DCDs. Mm -hmm. um, we, we've been utilizing the UNOS uh, filters, mm -hmm. and for most of our patients, we filter out any DCD more than 500 miles, okay. so we never see those offers, but when we have patients uh, harder to transplant uh, recipients, elderly, lower cast, mm -hmm. uh, we'll extend that to be more aggressive with uh, finding donors. Um, also, uh, being more willing to risk a dry run. Mm -hmm. If we're not getting many offers and there's a decent one, yeah. maybe recruit the lung, it might look good in the field once you bring it up, yeah. sure, we'll go look. Okay. Whereas other patients were, um, let's say at blood group A, lower age, mm -hmm. we we're confident they'll get lots of good offers right. and we won't waste the resources to go on a dry run, Okay. including DCDs. Yeah, Stephanie? I think, yeah, I think for us it's pretty similar, again, um, if you get the questionable offers for your six foot tall A, you know, you're going to get so many offers, you're going to find great lungs for them. Right. Um, but once you, once you're looking at those O's and when you look at your list, so, you know, all of, at least for me, every time I get an offer, I'm pulling up that list and I'm saying, who's been waiting? Mm -hmm. Who's been on this list three months? Right. I, we need to find them good organs. Mm -hmm. And then I increase the risk that I'll take. Yeah. So will you wait for, if you have an A, will you wait for a brain do donor? Or will you no, take if, a? If you have a beautiful DCD, I'm going to go do that. Okay. Yeah. And no, and well, you, we already talked about travel restrictions. Yeah. yeah. I mean, at our center, we've we've really found that the older patients at typos don't even really get many good, if any, but brain dead offers, or it's an aggressive open offer uh, after um, an extended period of time. You know, uh, exhausting uh, the wait list. So, you know, with, as we get close to the end here, how would you, what do you envision would be the best way to change uh, the CAS system, or what kind of adjustments would you like to see? We could just move down the table. I think overall, I'm very happy with the CAS system adjustments. Mm -hmm. um, for the patients that really need transplants urgently, we, uh, like I had, had a patient this week that got 19 offers in one day. Mm -hmm. So he had the choice of the best uh, lungs in the entire country. Yeah. So in general, it's fantastic. The only tweak I would consider is uh, the blood group O's, mm -hmm. and is five points enough to offset the, uh, the biological disadvantage and their donor pool access? Right. Um, yeah, I mean, I, 
I've got a lot of thoughts on how to enhance the caste system. Um, and, um, you know, unfortunately, a lot of it is going to require a little more time getting data in the current one in order mm -hmm. to allow us to do the appropriate modeling. Um, I think there are um, tweaks to sort of what's currently there. I, th I think the backbone is really strong and really good. Um, but I think there are going to be tweaks, and there's going to be potentially, in terms of the weightings for different things, um, and then um, we're probably going to be able to identify other um, variables or barriers to access that we could account for. We started with the ones that were, I think, obvious and, and we had data for, mm -hmm. but as more data uh, comes out around other features, then those can be added into the, um, into the formula. I think one of my concerns, and it gets back a little bit to the question you just asked around sort of donor selection in the new era, is just, um, is the CAS pushing us to, to take um, less optimal donors for less optimal recipients? And that's a, I think that's a challenging combination. I mean, I used to, for many years, I would just say, you know, a usable donor is a usable donor, and, and it needs to be used. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think that's changed a little bit for me um, because, um, I, you know, I think some of our recipients are less able to tolerate uh, some of the uh, rockier courses after mm -hmm. transplant. And, um, and so my concern is that particularly as, with this focus on five-year survival um, and sort of our older recipients being um, having lower overall scores, um, is are we um, channeling our um, less optimal donors again for some of these patients who are less likely to be able to um, tolerate easily, you know, a, a, a challenging post-operative course? And so, um, I think that's something we really need to keep an eye on because that could adversely impact our survival mm -hmm. when, in reality, you know, we're trying to right. to help that. Right. Um, and so, um, so I think being just very careful with that combination of a of a, um, a donor that's usable but not perfect with a recipient who's a reasonable recipient but not perfect. Stephanie, have you found yourself uh, in, uh, considering those realities? I mean, an extent you're saying, okay, I've got an older donor and I've got an extended criteria, I got an older recipient and an extended criteria donor. Am I putting this, am I putting this patient at a disadvantage or is the system causing me to be put this plate this patient at a disadvantage in order to get them transplanted yeah I, I have started to see that more at our mm -hmm. program as well where um, you like I said you just want to go and, and be more aggressive and see I think the one plus that we have which maybe you also have in Indiana is that um, NYU is a donor center and so I think as we if we can get more donor centers then that makes it easier because then organs that everyone say no to that are high risk for us, it's a low cost. We walk down to our own mm -hmm. OR. And a lot of the times, you can actually do enough recruitment in the OR or in those couple hours before they go down where unusable organs are now are now recovered. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I've been able to get good organs still for the marginal recipients. And I think it'd be nice if we could start doing that more nationally. Yeah, that's a, and we talked a little bit. You're not using EVLP, we are using a lot of EVLP. Are you using a lot of EVLP? Not really. Not really? No. No. Okay. Well, that's, you know, that's part of, you know, our, our, to try and offset what we think is a marginal donor to, we are using EVLP to further assess these organs and hopefully uh, weed out the ones that are truly marginal uh, of the extended criteria donors and use the ones that are, uh, that prove themselves to be uh, resilient, for lack of a better word, on ex vivo lung perfusion. Um, we've used, we've done a couple donors, 65 and older, on on EVLP, um, and it it brings up the question that, or really the the thought process that Matt had mentioned is, are we? This is what we're left with for these older patients: is these extended criteria donors? Are we doing the best thing for these individuals? Um, I'd like to echo what Stephanie said, is we do the same thing in Indiana. It, it is a tremendous advantage to mm -hmm. have the local procurement center, which is just on the street. We're not flying anywhere. It takes five minutes from the hospital, 15 minutes from my house to get there. Yeah. To, instead of uh, assess uh, with ex vivo or some other device, mm -hmm. just assess in situ yeah. and spend some time trying to recruit, bring up the lung, 
uh, while the donors there are still on the table and then make some decisions. And that's how we find donors for our elderly, lower caste score patients and still find them good lungs. Mm -hmm. uh, they just might not appear great radiographically. Right. And we can fix that in the OR. Right. Or I take a take a risk of going to look. Right. It costs very little time, no travel costs. Uh, and uh, so the donors, uh, recipients might wait longer, mm -hmm. but we can find somebody locally eventually, whether right. it's a DCD or something that doesn't look quite right. Well, that's nice. We don't, surprisingly, given the transplant volumes in our institution, both on the abdominal and thoracic side, we don't have that, at least not yet. I guess, Matt, this would fall under the radical efficiency that your task force <laughs> is being at, <laughs> has been. Well, I mean, you, you know, you mentioned that. So the, you know, the OBTN has um, created this um, task force um, that is designed to really focus on this. Um, it's called the expeditious task. Expeditious, force. sorry. Yeah. Um, and and that was you know it, it's interesting you guys both mentioned that because one of the ideas I suggested was this project I call it Eyes on the Prize. But basically any um, OPO that has a centralized donor facility and, and a, either a procuring surgeon uh, who works for them who does thoracic procuring, mm -hmm. or if they're you know based in a hospital um, like you all have is to have someone visually examine every lung that comes through that facility, mm -hmm. right? Because how many times have we been, you know, pleasantly surprised right. where someone goes to look at the heart, no one thought the lung was going to be usable, and then the person taking the heart is like, oh, these lungs are actually right. quite good. And so, um, and so anyway, so I'm, I'm hopeful that, that we'll be able to kind of push this forward through that um, initiative, but, um, but you're absolutely right. We have the one organ um, you know, we have the, the organ that is disadvantaged um, when we're assessing it in vivo, mm -hmm. um, and the imaging doesn't give us a full um, uh, example of what it could potentially do. We don't have the biochemical uh, things that, to assess it, mm -hmm. um, and it requires, I think, firsthand uh, examination and evaluation to kind of know that. So, right. um, so yeah, so the, the OPTNs, I think, aware of that. We're, you know, the... They are working on this, and um, and we'll see what comes out of this um, task force. But that's certainly uh, something that's on people's minds. It does. It, it creates a challenge as we as we try to evaluate the impact of the allocation system, and the and how it's impacting allocation in the U.S. for lungs. And it complicates things because there are so many other initiatives and so many other things that are going on. Technology changes, preservation mm -hmm. changes. Right. Um, the use of these um, donor uh, care facilities. So there's all of these other things that are impacting allocation potentially for the better or for the worse. Mm -hmm. And um, and so it makes, um, you know, our job as a community assessing the impact of CAS just that much harder. Harder, yeah. Right? Yeah, that, it, there's so many external forces at work beyond just this scoring system in terms of how we how we get these organs. Uh, I think uh, we've always thought that there's, we're underutilizing the resource and, and, uh, and your task force and what you're doing at your, uh, your organ procurement centers is a way of overcoming that limitation and expanding the donor pool beyond the traditional 25 to 30 percent. Well, I think this has been a good discussion about the, a great discussion about the, uh, the implementation of CAS and its controversies. Uh, I appreciate you all participating. I'll open it up to any final thoughts. Does anybody have any final thoughts? Stephanie, do you have any words of wisdom as we depart the, the round table? Well, that's a straight table, more or less. More or less, <laughs> less a round table. I'm deferring to him, the CAS expert. The CAS expert. <laughs> yes. It was a wonderful, wonderful topic, and uh, thanks for organizing. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah. It's good. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, and uh, we appreciate uh, uh, you all being here. Thank you. <laughs>